Welcome back. And we are starting off uh, this morning taking a look at the criminal justice system in Belize. Uh, we had this guest on a few weeks ago, and of course, uh, one of the things we didn't get to discuss was looking at ways that we can improve the current system. So we have with us returning Kendra Hoyt, who is a criminal criminology lecturer and life coach at Gillen University. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we are fresh off uh, the launch of a new crime fighting strategy here in Belize City. And uh, I think it is a great opportunity to take a broader look as to what it takes to have an effective uh, criminal justice system. And so we want to take the opportunity to tap into your experience and, mm -hmm. and uh, learn about some of the things that have been proven around the world. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So let me just start off there uh, as opening up the discussion. Well, uh, one thing I want to really make clear, Marlene, is that I am no expert. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in expert mentality. I have a, a walk of life of 25 years in the States doing the work and then being here in Belize off and on over the last 25 years in between. Um, and I think I mentioned last time this idea of the three separate entities, police, corrections, um, and the courts being sort of working in isolation of each other. And so when we talk about enhancing, mm -hmm. um, for me, as I thought about this, I thought about, you know, when I said that to you guys, I, I meant it, that there's this insular sort of thing. And I mentioned communication. Mm -hmm. and, and collaboration is a word that I think um, sometimes people often uh, mis misuse and don't understand the power of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we define collaboration as working towards a common goal together, mm -hmm. and we think about our current criminal justice system that works in isolation of itself in these three entities, collaboration, um, and I would want to say like a collaborative justice system as opposed to a criminal justice system. And so I would want to start the conversation there, mm -hmm. um, which would then lend itself to the idea of communication, yeah. right? Now, you, you, I believe this was a part of the conversation yes. before, looking at the three separate entities, right. and as you said, they, they work in isolation, the uh, police, the courts, and the prison. Correct. Now, some would argue that uh, there are links uh, between these three entities. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. the police will uh, gather all that is necessary to take the case to the courts. Mm -hmm. The courts mm -hmm. will make a ruling, and then if the person is found mm -hmm. guilty mm -hmm. and sentenced, then they'll go into the mm -hmm. prison system. Mm -hmm. So why do you say they're isolated? So Marlene, you're correct. That is, and I actually mentioned this last time, that the police are the gateway, mm -hmm. right? They're the entrance for an individual based on what you just said. So that linkage you just made, absolutely correct, mm -hmm. right? However, what's missing between those two, these three entities is, I'm going to use a word that sometimes people say is a bad word, transparency. Mm -hmm. um, transparent dialogue, um, transparent, open, honest communication at the point of a person being arrested or found guilty on the street of some criminality. Okay, at that point, a police officer's job, a, a well-trained police officer's job is to assess the situation. Mm -hmm. First of all, is this a viable arrest, right? Mm -hmm. Is it viable? Does it require an arrest? I often, uh, I would say on a whole, there's probably a multitude of people who are brought to a police station. Maybe that's not actually where they should go at that moment. Maybe there's some social service related uh, mechanism that should step in. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a police officer's judgment call, right? An assessment of the situation between one, two or more people, perhaps, a situation. Upon going to a police station, right? Many, say we have a police station, I'll use an example, where there's a court above, right? There's a court above. The point at which a police officer decides <clears throat> this person, it warrants them then going to the court, you've got to make sure this is a, a, a viable, because you're about to get someone charged, right? Yeah. You're going to fingerprint them, you're going to get, and I would venture to say, and I believe my uh, colleague who sat with me last time, Mr. Oliveira, mentioned the social welfare component. Mm -hmm. This is a component at which, at the basic level of police care, so many things could be referred out and deviated from a court system. If there was better assessment, better training for the viability of this arrest, number one. Number two, the point at which a judge is involved or a magistrate, the dialogue between the courts and the police needs to be transparent, open, um, dare I say, say collaborative, mm -hmm. in a way that says, look, is this something that, does this make sense? Are there other entities that need to be involved? The, for, let, me, let, me, let me stick go ahead, there, push me. Isn't that 
a bit of a concern. If you're talking of uh -huh. a magistrate or a judge having any kind of collaboration with the police department, uh -huh. wouldn't that then disadvantage the person coming before the court? It shouldn't. It should be if, if all three entities are working towards a common goal and if, this is a proposal, if the goal, and you're, I don't know if you recall me saying this, that the ideal idea is that we do not incarcerate people. There are those who need to be, clearly, right? Mm -hmm. For a number of reasons. However, if the larger percentage is about a community or social welfare issue, mm -hmm. and we come at it, if the magistrate, if the police come at it from the idea that, you know what, we want to actually help build community and bring people back into community and not exclude them. If that's the common goal, then they work together towards that common goal. Clearly, if a law has been broken and you have to institute the law accordingly, then you do, right? There's a murder involved, there's something, a domestic violence case. In many cases, though, it's civil disputes. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of civil disputes that occur that are charged. Um, there are family-related things that occur, and other interveners need to be a part of it. Now, having worked um, with many courts uh, systems in the States, our judges and police talked to each other, often knew each other. Um, we're able to sort of work out um, diversion court related behavior. So saying juveniles, for instance, is this a situation that we need to charge a juvenile um, and give them an adult record? Mm -hmm. Or should we try and um, do something preventative, proactive in advance? That is between, so that becomes the assessment of a police officer working then in conjunction with the courts to say what other mechanisms are available. Mm -hmm. Is there a social worker? I think we mentioned this as well. We lack social workers countrywide. Having skilled social workers um, to assess and work with the police. I have worked in, in, in districts where every police station has a social worker mm -hmm. Can on site. Can I interject site. briefly? By all means. <laughs> While I understand and, and, and I respect the position where you're coming from, mm -hmm. when you look at the reality of the situation here in the country, mm -hmm. I don't know that we have that kind of an expertise for perhaps for want of a better word mm -hmm. within the police department where mm -hmm. they are adequately trained to be able to make certain decisions mm -hmm. on their own you're saying that an officer should be able to assess a certain situation mm -hmm. and take a decision as to what the next measure should be mm -hmm. but the overall impression that we get is that a majority of these officers are only trained to think and use brute force mm -hmm. as opposed to exercise a measure of discretion. Agreed. So how does, how does one apply in a real life scenario mm -hmm. some of the things that you're mentioning that should take place in terms of the dialogue or the communication between the court system and the law enforcement authorities? So this idea of, of enhancing as you're mm -hmm. as you're saying Marlene enhancing and I'm saying sort of developing mm -hmm. um, and I say the word developing because in some respects I agree with you 100 percent we don't have by and large a, a skilled enough set of people in those mm -hmm. roles to make I agree and dare I say that sometimes one needs to start a little bit from scratch mm -hmm. and wipe the board clean um, perhaps of those individuals who are not well skilled who have not perhaps been well vetted um, I agree that we have a, 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 I'm trying to be careful about this, but we have a very young, sometimes very young set of people who are not well skilled um, and perhaps entered into the field of police for the idea of carrying a gun maybe or having mm -hmm. some power and control over, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so if that's the mentality I enter with, the serve and protect, and the protect means brute force mm -hmm. and eliminate anything that causes detriment to a community, mm -hmm. Well, then that's the mentality you're going to get, right, as a force. If you enter with the idea of I'm serving, right, if that's the prelude and that's the more important role, yeah. I'm a servant to community, I'm working with community, again, to my initial point last time is the above and below, us and them, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. if, if we enter with this idea that we're actually all here, that we're working in collaboration with each other, this is not something to happen overnight. Yeah. This is a place of transparency the powers that be of these three entities sitting at the table together and saying what's not working what are we not doing well what are we doing well where are our partnerships with community where are they not where do they need to be built this is not something that can happen overnight and it does it might require wiping the slate clean of some individuals and starting anew well let, let's 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 
take the situation that we see today yep. because I think it's very important that that we ground the conversation in the reality of what exists in our country yes. and we know we have a crisis mm -hmm. with violence and crime in this country. Absolutely. And I know, as I say, I know the police quotes numbers all the time. They'll say this week none, and then next mm -hmm. week we have, it's like a, a chronic condition. Their flare-ups, calm down flare-ups. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. but fundamentally what it has done is that it has degraded the security that people have within the country. Mm -hmm. And there is also a cynicism about being able to effectively stop or prevent crimes from taking place. We've seen several strategies being um, being employed in, in Belize City. We saw from a uh, quality of life uh, focus, mm -hmm. um, looking at bicycle crimes and tinting of vehicles mm -hmm. and some of the things that they felt perhaps would have helped to lessen more right. major crimes. Right. Uh, we've seen attempts at mediation. Mm -hmm. We've seen attempts at ne negotiating with mm -hmm. gang leaders. We have seen uh, the ACT strategy, and now mm -hmm. there is a new crime fighting strategy. Mm -hmm. So my question is, it seems to be more important, and I hear what you're saying about enhancing the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. but before we even get there, we need to take care of what's happening now. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need to get this condition under control. Agreed, and, and we do absolutely have a police force that is not trusted, mm -hmm. and that, that um, it feels that there are those above the law, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And our police should not be above the law. And that is a very, and again, and again we'll go back to, to Her, uh, Herbert Gales, Dr. Gales' yes. uh, report, because that was a fundamental point. It was, it, absolutely. That people don't have trust in police, right. in the police department. Right. Well, particularly when your news is constantly highlighting rapists and and armed dealers and drug mm -hmm. dealers within the police force or police who are uh, committing illegal acts and mm -hmm. not being held accountable it says to me as a citizen well what's the point of me respecting you why should i look to you to help protect me when when you're above the law mm -hmm. um i myself have been uh i've had police here detain me um illegally and try to extort 200 dollars from me um, and my reaction to that was, it's not going to happen. In fact, I'm going to go straight to the police department and file a, 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 a case against you. And that was uh, greeted like surprise. My gosh, mm -hmm. you're going to file a report? Nobody does that. Well, why? Because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm not afraid. Why should I be afraid? What your police officers did was illegal. Mm -hmm. I did nothing illegal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that to, there is, there's... <laughs> This is, a, this is huge, and this is a community-based issue in terms of um, flipping the paradigm. And again, to my point, and I, I say it with all, res all due respect, that there certainly are some individuals uh, that need not be in the police force. Mm -hmm. um, they don't represent with a code of ethic and integrity. Um, and again, goes back to if the powers that be want a police force that is respectable, they have to walk the talk. Mm -hmm. And if they're not walking the talk, then we the citizens have absolutely no reason to respect them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, <clears throat> it, Marlene, this is, a, this is dealing with what's going on with our police department is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree that the police uh, force needs some real serious evaluation before we can look well, at the three, other, the three entities in its totality. Before we, go, be, be, before we move on from the topic, I just wanna, I wanna uh, discuss because one of the questions I've been asking and, and we really haven't had the police department yet to, to discuss their latest yes. strategy is what type of assessment has been done you know I think right. we, we really fail to use data as our foundation oh, sometimes we don't. In, in, in these types of programs and uh, with all the strategies that have been implemented and the new one that has been launched are you aware of any because you you are a criminology right. lecturer in the country right. of what type of studies or research have been done to understand the effectiveness of these types of programs we are not here using data driven we are not using research and data driven information i think we're doing anecdotal mm -hmm. um, and probably a lot of qualitative um, responses to things and not quantitative um, I would venture to say that there definitely needs to be mm -hmm. um, a countrywide, and we're small enough. Yeah. We are absolutely small enough to do a countrywide assessment uh, from community as well as internally, mm -hmm. um, you know, and have um, our our police force um, assessed from ground up. And and in terms of the qualifications, what do I need to be a police officer? What's being asked of me? Mm -hmm. What am I entering the police force for? Mm -hmm. um, how young am I? How trained am I? Am I capable? Um, 
And back to my original point, why am I entering? What is it? Do I want to carry a gun? Do I want to be a strong arm? Do I want to protect? Uh, do I want to be part of? But the police force has to have a goal, a vision. And reading uh, my own reading of some of the vision and mission, I, I wonder. It's very heavy co crime control and militaristic. Mm -hmm. And so if you enter, your goal is sort of from a militaristic standpoint, and you're there to, you know, uh, create yeah, a strong armed and sort of protected and secure people and create an exclusionary model, well then that's what you get. In some respects, we've built exactly what we get. Now some people will watch this conversation and say our focus is on the wrong place. Why are we, uh -huh. why are we looking at the, at the police department? Why are we looking at, at the, at the uh, prison when we know right. uh, the conviction rate is so low? Why aren't we talking about the persons who are involved in right. criminal activity and are taking the guns, going into businesses, and, and uh, oftentimes leaving innocent victims in, in the wake. Well, so then I get a question the other day, mm -hmm. Ms. Kendra, we don't have a gun manufacturer in Belize, so where are the guns coming from? Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, thing the is, that's the there's, assumption. A, right, that's there's the assumption. a proliferation of, of guns into the country uh -huh. that goes about unabated. Absolutely. Guns come in from wherever they come in, mm -hmm. particularly from the West, from what we're being told. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be no measure of stemming the flow of guns into the country. So that a lot of the crimes that are being committed are <clears throat> crimes that are being committed with firearms that the so-called experts can't account for in terms of was this weapon licensed? Right, they're unlicensed. Was, yeah. yeah, for the most part, yeah. they're unlicensed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can vet a licensed gun all you want. You can mm -hmm. get the ballistics all you want on a licensed gun, but that's not the gun that you're going to find causing the crime. Exactly. So there, there's sort of a, that's really, that's crazy, right? So I'm going to spend all my time getting the licensed gun owners when in fact the guns we're getting are, are not. Yeah. And they're high powered machine guns and others. Mm -hmm. They're high level guns that. They're not your, your average hunter or somebody who's protecting their home. Here's the other thing. I was able to attend the rollout of the National Crime Fighting Strategy last Tuesday. Okay. And there seems to be great emphasis being placed on certain areas of uh, law enforcement, crime prevention, mm -hmm. and arrests and what have you. But one of the questions that I had for the head table last Tuesday was, well, where is the training aspect of this? Right. Because at the end of the day, you're working towards a particular objective. Right. Perhaps right. part of it is conviction. What good does it serve for you to strengthen all areas and you don't build the capacity of an officer being able to gather the proper evidence mm -hmm. needed for them to actually go before the court and right. ensure that there is a conviction for whatever arrest and charge is done for, right. for any number of crimes that, that are committed. Right. I think the response that I got was matter of factly. It wasn't something where we're saying, look, we're putting training right. as the prerequisite right. before we invest in other areas of, of right. the resources necessary to tackle crime and violence. Absolutely, you need to have the objective. How are you gonna do it? Mm -hmm. So you might have the end result. Yes, we want to eliminate crime. We want to eliminate mm -hmm. gang activity. We want to eliminate, how are you gonna do that? And, and what is the actual strategy and what is the course of training, but mm -hmm. also um, back to my initial uh, last week, what is the root cause? Mm -hmm. So you can train all you want, again, um, but if you're not understanding the root cause, and, so if, and then again, to your point just now, if the goal is then to get a higher conviction rate, I wanna, I wanna be a little, I, I wanna push you on that and say, is that the goal, to get a higher conviction rate? Um, of what, and is it viable? Mm -hmm. um, so you would need, again, back to my initial assessment skills. Police need to have better skills at assessing a situation, gathering the information, and presenting a viable case um, so that if the conviction happens, it's a viable conviction. And it's not a waste of the time of the court, mm -hmm. right? Um, because our backlog, you mentioned, Marlene, about you know, the prisons. Yes, so we have a low conviction rate. We have a lot of people sitting on remand. So there's a backlog, right? What does the backlog do to? Is it just there's a bunch of cases that don't have viability and so everything sits there and waits for years at end, on average four to five years? Mm -hmm. On average. And then by the time it goes to court, the people have lost, right? Yeah. People forget things, uh, evidence has been lost or not properly secured, right? And so statements then the case, are recanted. Statements are recanted. Eyewitnesses don't recall. Yeah. My students do papers all the time on eyewitness recall. This mm -hmm. is psychological matter of that, right? 
And then the case is gone. So I've just sat in prison for how long? For nothing. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm innocent or guilty didn't even matter because mm -hmm. now the conviction rate is gone, yep. mm -hmm. right? So going back to addressing crime, and, and I, I, I really want us, I want to hear your response in terms of, because I hear the focus on the police department right. and definitely as the gateway uh, and as, let me step back a bit. When we talk about the perception of the police department, it is important. And, yes, and I think any, anybody who, who looks at what's happening in our country, we understand why it's right, important. Right. Uh, if I reflect on, on, on children growing up in school, yes. one of the things you're first taught are who are community workers. Yes. So you dress up like a nurse, a doctor, yeah. a police officer, a firefighter. Somewhere along the line, yeah. Uh, the concept of a police officer being mm -hmm. a community worker has yes. been lost based on, yes. on what you were speaking yes. about before. Their vision is more uh, authoritative. Mm -hmm. Yep, crime control. We look at the persons involved in criminal activity at this mm -hmm. point in time, mm -hmm. but there are also, I would venture to say, 15 and younger, yes. all these children yes. who are growing up seeing what we are seeing right now. This yeah. will be the foundation yep. for their beliefs, for their value system, yeah. for what they perceive uh, a, a community police relationship should mm -hmm. be like. And that concerns me, because even if we are able to get today's situation under control, yeah. we have younger children coming right. up believing that, you know, police are bad man, or uh -huh. I could do what I want, or gangs are really a right. better option for me. Right. Lead by example, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I'm saying, how do we how do we arrest the situation of the people who are involved right. and are being trained to become involved? in crime, in criminal activity. So when you talk about, it's funny, I thought about this the other night and I, I wanted to say this, and I don't know if this is really awful because I sat here and I thought, we have this set of young people, as you say, 16 mm -hmm. and younger, 15 and younger. <clears throat> One of the things I see that's a contributor to criminality or opportuni opportunity for crime behavior with young people in particular is lack of education or lack of access to free education, dare mm -hmm. I say. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna say this. <clears throat> We have so many young people who can't even go to school because their families can't afford the uniform, the books. This is public school, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're left to their own devices. They're at home. Um, maybe their families are, are suffering for food or mm -hmm. basic needs. So they go out and steal. They immediately, at a very young age, mm -hmm. I have them in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I have to talk to them all the time. The boys, you can't do that. They stole from me. And I would talk to them, like, what are you doing? You're six years old. But my mom, my pa, me, mm -hmm. yes, babe. So ha, there is a, a basic level of need. So poverty rate, mm -hmm. lack of education, access to free education. Every single child in this country should be afforded an education without hindrance. Education, knowledge is key. And absolutely, I firmly believe if you are given a good foundation of education, your pr propensity for criminality lessens. <clears throat> One, right? Your basic needs need to be met. Mm -hmm. And so if, if I am a young person and my basic needs are met and my education is high quality and accessible to me, and then as I get older, there's a job market for me. Employment um, is viable within country. I don't need to be exported out of the country for that. I'm less likely to be involved in criminality. I recently had a conversation with the prisons about this section of people who are sort of the, the constant recidivism rate. They're in and out. Mm -hmm. And they're between this age group that's 35 to 45. We call them career criminals. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they do stupid, dishonest crimes, right? Theft and robbery. Small, petty, but constant. It's because their needs are not being met. They can't get a job. They've already been deemed a felon. Um, they don't have the access to certain things. They have low-level education. And so it, it's accessible for them to do these things and constantly have the revolving door. And not because of what you said, because the prison's comfortable. <laughs> I just thought of that, that you said, yeah. because it's not comfortable enough that I want to hang out there. But if I don't have all these other things accessible to me in community, mm -hmm. then yeah, I'm probably going to do that. And if I pile on top of that, by the time I'm at that age, I also am now addicted to some form of drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, then I have other needs I'm meeting, right, yeah. internally. So it, this is a, a systemic issue, and it does start, I believe, at the, at the foundation, right, mm -hmm. at the formative years. And I, I do, I, last night I really thought heavily that it, this is a country that's small enough that we should be able to afford every single child 
in this country a free, high quality education okay. from infant one to sixth form, straight through. Honestly, I honestly believe that. And I if I so as choose well. as a parent to pay for my child to go to private school, fine, that's my choice. But every child, no child should be sitting at home saying, I can't go to school because my mom can't afford the uniform or I can't pay the, the school next fee. school fee or whatever. That's ridiculous to me, mm -hmm. horrifying. And I have children mm -hmm. in my neighborhood who, I said, why are you home? Why are you home? You should be at school. We can't, miss, we can't. Yeah. It breaks my heart. Now, in your classes, you, you, you've spoken about working with uh, persons who are already within the system, yes. uh, within, the, within the university. Uh huh. What is the message you hear from them? in terms of what they feel can be done <laughs> and needs to be done to really see the turnaround mm -hmm. that we're all uh, hoping to be able to see with the crime situation. I'm glad that you asked that. Just, just this week, um, I spoke with, again, I, I mentioned many of my students are BDF, police, immigration, and customs, okay? okay? Um, at high levels, many of them have already been in the system working 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Um, so they're older adult learners, they have families. Um, they're out in the field, they're at borders, border patrol and such. <clears throat> and they said to me, Miss, please tell, tell the news that we're doing the work. Everything you've taught us, we're shifting the paradigm yeah. internally. They're shifting their mindset. They're shifting from the us and them to the we. They're shifting from um, a, a punitive way of looking at things to a more rehabilitative way, to a more inclusionary process to a restorative justice model, to a model that says, this is us, this is our community. Whether I'm an officer um, or not, I'm not above you or below you, I'm with you. Um, and so they have assured me that, miss, when I greet people at the border, when I, even those who have brought, I look at them a different way since taking your class, I ask the question, who are you, what's your story? Tell me who you are in this moment so that as I proceed forward, I can look at the totality of the person. Mm -hmm. That's just one simple shift yeah. in the way that we philosophically greet another person in our work, Yeah. right? One more issue, because we're quickly running out of time yes, already. Yes. Um, but there, it's something I don't think we discuss enough. We have, and, and Isania mentioned it before, and it's a part of the strategy uh, that is to be employed. We have designated areas as mm. hot spots. Right. Let, wait, wait, let's go back way before. There was a north side, south side right. construct. Right, exactly. Um, and now that doesn't necessarily play out in the same way. Now they're just different pockets Streets of and, society. Right, right. Uh, red zones, gang ridden yeah. areas, whatever yeah. you want to call them. Yeah. What does that do to the psyche of, of, of the people who live in those right. areas? Uh, whether or not they're involved in right. criminal activity. Well, and is this effective in being able to address right. crime? I think you spoke about it eloquently last time that, you know, coming from an area that's been sort of red flag, there's a yeah. scarlet letter already on it, um, and makes a presumption about you as an individual, a young person, also puts you at risk uh, just for travel and, and how much do I now become influenced in order to keep myself and my family safe, right? And the stigma attached to that. I think we have to destigmatize, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And recognize that. Um, you know, Belize City is, is, is an urban community, like many urban communities globally, right? And so it's highly condensed. Mm -hmm. um, it has a, it's going to have a propensity for certain behaviors just because of the dense population and perhaps the lack, again, of access to certain um, opportunities and things that people well should deserve. Mm -hmm. um, and so how, how do, I'm going to say it, how do police help destigmatize that yeah. and come from that from a community policing perspective and say look we're here to work with we're not here to say oh man you're george street then you must be aha mm -hmm. uh -huh, i saw you come out of there you must be affiliated with no man um this is where i live this is my family it's not about i'm attached to a particular street yeah. or identity i have my own identity in my family yeah. so how how do how does law enforcement um stop perpetuating um, that idea pocketing places. I, yeah. Some of that is labeled. Yeah. Um, and it's the it's way. Like making them I become mean, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, it's a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy because you live, so that's what you're, that's your destiny. Yeah. Um, and so then how do we then create other social community networks that say, no, we're gonna take back our streets, so to speak, mm -hmm. and look at it from a community perspective and not these targeted little scarlet red areas yeah. and you must be deemed. But that, that's community. That's community owning that and saying, no, 
That's not our label. We look different, act different, we sound different, we walk a different, this is not who we are. Um, that's, the, that's the anomaly. So what you want to hope, right, is that we shift the idea right. that the, the bad seed is the anomaly, that the good seed is the vast majority, mm -hmm. not the inverse. I'm, we I'm talked listening about this. to what you're saying, and I am thinking of all the other factors that come to play. Mm -hmm. Tell you're me. thinking about socioeconomic issues. You're thinking yes. geopolitical issues uh -huh. that are bubbling below the surface that a lot of times people don't really talk about when we discuss crime and violence mm -hmm. and how neighborhoods are labeled mm -hmm. one or the other. There are a lot of things that are taking place, you know, that are not necessarily things that are openly discussed. We're right. having this discussion and we're not talking about the poverty, well, certain aspects of aspects poverty of it, right. that drive people to be the way they are, to right. think the way they are. So that when you discuss South Side and North Side, people have become so used to hearing it mm. that it's almost a part of who they become. They, yeah. they own it as part of their identity. It, I, I'm, I'm totally, you know, baffled when I really think about all of that. Well, there's an internalized oppression with that. Mm -hmm. People internalize, as you said, and they wear it. They own mm -hmm. it. Um, and that's, that, that takes time to unpack and unravel um, and reverse because it's been so heavily inundated that people do assimilate mm -hmm. to that. And I go back to my earlier bad word, transparency, mm -hmm. right? So can we have transparent conversations publicly about the politics and the socioeconomic climate mm -hmm. and why they play? In, and right now we're in a, a political era mm -hmm. for the next few weeks. And, um, and our, to a point made in the last show is, you know, who's getting paid off? Who, uh, whose needs are being met in an inappropriate, illegal manner, and why is that acceptable? Why do we not say mm -hmm. what it is, say what you mean and mean what you say? Um, that's a transparent conversation, and how, how ready are we to have that without being afraid? Yeah. Because that's what I hear, fear often from people. There's actually um, a, an ingrained level of fear that citizens have here um, because of this hierarchy, this political mm -hmm. hierarchy. Mm -hmm. There's fear. That's astounding to me. Really? They are servant Treated leaders. Passive. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. They're servant leaders. They work for us. Why am I afraid? Mm -hmm. So absolutely, that's a transparent, con I want to have that conversation. <laughs> if you were to say where the most critical area, and, and, and it's, it's a real situation. When, when you speak about children not going, I've heard it, you know, yes. uh, a school fee isn't paid, so they send them home, yeah. and the school is frustrated because they need to get the parent in, the parent won't right. come. Right. Um, so they send the children home, and, and the kids aren't in school. Sometimes they don't have parents who are present. Absolutely. Or they don't have parents who are giving them the level of affection and right. love that they should. Right. Um, sometimes the parents are struggling in being mm -hmm. able to uh, make enough money to even just pay the rent or right. put food on right. the table. So there's so many levels issues when we're looking yes. at this situation. And it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Where would you say is, is the best, and I always hear people say it has to be a multi-prong approach and multi-faceted approach. And, well, it does. And I, it has to be holistic, Marlene. Yeah. It can't, because if we just look at one, like you said, the family unit, right? Mm -hmm. If we look at a social welfare, the family unit, everything you just said and everything I said last time about gang membership, young people are looking for a sense of belonging and love and support. Yeah. So if I'm not getting that home, right? Yeah. But I can get it here, then I, I just very well may do that. But so it has to be a multi-prong approach, it has to be holistic. We have to look at all ends and we have to look at the whole family yeah. because we do have families that are injured, that are missing components that a family needs to thrive yeah. effectively. Um, and we cannot do that with a single prong approach. You just can't yeah. because you have alcoholism, abuse, you have domestic violence, you have lack of funds, lack of food. La My gosh, mm -hmm. you have all these things happening. That's why the social welfare unit countrywide needs to be expanded mm -hmm. and there need to be better trained um, social workers countrywide in all districts, in all villages, accessible to assist families from, from the point of a woman being pregnant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, how do I now honor this young person? And many of our women are very young. They're not ready to be parents, mm -hmm. right? They're still needing parenting themselves. How do we hold that and honor that space because life is about to come into the world?
Okay. Well, we are out of time. So <laughs> that's as far as we can go in this conversation for today. But I think it is absolutely important uh, that we have this conversation, uh, mm -hmm. open it up uh, to mm -hmm. the wider public so that we can look at crime from a different perspective. And that's what you've allowed us to do this morning. Thank, Thank you so you. much for being here. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and uh, take a break. And when we come back, we will have a conversation uh, with uh, different representatives talking about a sexual abuse campaign that is being launched. That's coming up after the break. Stay tuned.